me to know where to start um, or, or when, where to end, actually. I, my brief is, and I'm not going to introduce myself, I, I'm going to go straight in if I may. My brief is that um, I have 15 minutes to talk. And in that 15 minutes, I have to talk about English in Europe. Um, I have failed already, <laughs> but I will try to give a few hints, a little bit of background to give you a bit of a sense, and I hope in our discussion later we may um, develop this further. So, the topic of English in wider society, I'm not going to talk about within the school here at all, much as I would like to. <laughs> um, I'd like to just start by uh, raising your awareness, if I may, of the country which I now live in, um, up in the north of Sweden. Here is Sweden, this dark green area, and marked on this map is Umeå, my current hometown. As you see, it's well up towards the north of Sweden. If I sort of roughly draw a line across here, this is the Arctic region. So, 45 minutes by plane, and I'm in the Arctic region, okay? Um, where, of course, it's absolutely dark now. It's 24-7 darkness there. Where I am in Umea through December, I would say it's just getting light now. It'll be light for another three or four hours, okay? Fortunately, we have massive uh, water provision, and therefore we have a major supply of electricity via hydroelectricity, so the town of Umea is brightly lit 24-7. <laughs> and by now, I'm pretty sure the snow will have arrived. It's come very late this year. Um, thinking back to last year, the snow came in October, and it went by the end of April. Um, <coughs> it was generally around about this high by this time, okay? And they have, of course, fantastic snow clearance there. 24-7, so at 3 in the morning I'd be woken up as, as some sort of vehicle was coming to clear the drive outside my block of flats so that I could get out my bike to ride to work at 8 in the morning because, of course, everyone cycles everywhere, okay? Everyone has winter tires on their bikes, so it's a different environment and very interesting as an experience, but I'll come back to that later if I may. Um, all right, then thinking about languages around Europe, a little bit of a very, very brief sort of historical run through looking at this map. Because when you think about Europe, as, as uh, Francois elaborated very interestingly yesterday, it's a, a very, very multilingual context. And historically, really, um, we move towards becoming uh, a a region where each country had a stated national language, only around the 17 to 1800s, where a language is used to define the national borders of each country. So there is still, to quite an extent, in most countries of Europe, a tendency to think of one nation, one language. And that certainly is reflected in European, European uh, policy, where the EU, the member countries of the EU, uh, of which there are now 28, each of them has m mainly one language defined as their national policy. I hesitate to be precise about this because I'm not quite sure of the number that have at least two languages. But out of 28 countries, there are 24 official languages spoken and, and published in EU documentation. So it gives you a sense of it. Some, a number of countries have very clear stated policies of more than one national language, but not many of them. So historically over Europe, um, there was a tendency for certain languages to predominate as second or foreign languages. And one could roughly say that in the South, French was widely spoken as a second or foreign language. This is very roughly. In the, towards the East, German would be found very frequently. And up in the North, you would find English as a dominant first, uh, second language or foreign language. So that's a historical picture. And, uh, Abraham de Swan certainly outlined that in some detail in his publication of 2003, I think. Um, however, the picture has shifted substantially nowadays. And if one looks at 
what languages are most accessible right across Europe, you can certainly say English is very widely spoken within the urban regions of Europe, I want to stress. Of course, the uh, historical position of French and German is still wide, fairly widely spoken, but with each new generation, I would say English is taking over more and more. Not, and I'm not talking about within the school situation, I'm talking about out on the streets here and focusing on that. So, with that rough picture, and a very rough picture, my next task is to just, just give a little bit of information about one or two regions of Europe before I sort of move up to the northern region, which I'll talk about in more detail, if I may. So, oh, first of all, Europeans say this about English, that English is the most widely spoken language, okay? 67% of Europeans say English is one of the two most useful languages to themselves. Only 17% suggest German, and 16% suggest French, and 14% suggest Spanish, and 6 Chinese. So you can see the, dominance, the dominant view, predominant view of English in Europe today. In Spain, an interesting uh, perspective, firstly, on one of the southern European regions. Certainly we can say that during Franco's time, where it was really important to establish a unified nation, and obviously there was a political agenda there, um, the focus being strongly national, the, the political message, let's say, was that it was one nation, one language, standard Spanish. And looking back at the history of movies, films and TV programs, there were substantial Latin American imports because, of course, they came in Spanish. So I'm told lots of soaps, soaps in Spanish were bought from, I'm not sure where, whether it was from Argentina. Uh, you will know more than I do about that. And I'm told by Spanish colleagues, people from mainland Spain, that there was a feeling in that period uh, and soon after that Spain was rather on the edge of Europe. Maybe it wasn't part of the wider Europe. And then Spain became a member of the EU and things began to change gradually. It has now moved to a position where for Spain, English is a very high priority, I would say. And whilst films and TV programs are currently dubbed from, from films and TV programs produced in English are currently dubbed in Spanish. There are discussions now at ministry level about moving away from dubbing and using subtitles. If that happens, it will be a very substantial indicator of Spain's view that English is a real priority. And I'll come back to that point later, if I may, with some evidence from Sweden. Certainly there's a high volume of music produced in Spanish, of course, because it's such a major world language. And so importantly, of course, there's not so much exposure to, to music in English, as one might find in other parts of Europe. Um, however, the internet use uh, in English is very widespread, and English in schools is a high priority. And I won't talk in detail about that, but I'll just refer you to of course, I'm sure some of you will have heard of the bilingual primary programs that the British Council have been supporting over, I think, more than 10 years now. But interestingly, also, the Madrid government have um, supported a major primary bilingual program throughout their schools in English. And so there's, there's obviously a perceived priority that for the very youngest category of school students, this is an important development and initiative to take. As to the effectiveness of it, that's another discussion that we could have later. Now, obviously, there are pluses and minuses about what's happening. So this is a very brief snapshot. My apologies for it being so brief, but just to give a hint. Moving then on to Germany, where the presence of English, perhaps I would say, is more widespread in some of the urban regions, but I hesitate to judge that, honestly. Film and TV programs in English are dubbed, very definitely. German is a very big language, after all. It's not surprising. Um, however, English is becoming a dominant language in some domains, and there's some research evidence on that. Certainly, internet and digital games are widely used in English, and pop music in English is dominant. 
very dominant. And there has been a long history of that. I, my memory goes back far enough, I'm afraid, uh, to the Beatles being in Hamburg. So if one goes back to the early 1960s, that's how long the association with uh, pop music in English, at least, has been. And I'm sure others of you will remember other things that I've long since forgotten. <laughs> Um, but I would say certainly English is not as widespread as it is in the Nordic countries. And so, let's move on to talking a little bit about that. Firstly, Finland. One example, um, partly because I've got some good data to look at here. Um, certainly English exposure is extensive. And reports are that it's spread mainly since the Second World War, so from the 50s. Um, and Anglo-American pop culture and technological developments have been major factors here. Most TV and film has subtitles. This is a really important factor. The cognitive processing that goes on as you listen in one language and read or don't read in another language is substantial. And as you go through that processing experience, um, a lot is happening in terms of gaining confidence and, and ability to focus only on the spoken word. And I would say that from the age of three or four years, as children are becoming initial bilinguals, this is happening. They're not, they're at a pre-reading stage after all. So they're simply listening and they're listening in English. So we can say they are becoming incidental bilinguals here before they ever get to school. And that is an important issue, I think. So youth culture, tourism and commerce, English is the language. And very, very high connectivity in terms of computer access and therefore substantially in English. A little bit of data here. Um, there's been a fantastic study done by colleagues at Ivaskala University, and at the end of this I have the reference for those of you who would like to look at the full study, but I ask permission if I could use just a couple of slides to illustrate some of uh, the picture from their data outside the school. So here we see that Finnish people, Finns, see and hear English very substantially in the street in shops, stores, cafes, restaurants, and on public transport. A little bit less in the workplace and a little bit less in the home, and less in study libraries, banks, and offices, okay? So in the street, they see and hear English on a daily basis. English all around us, just the exposure experience of that incidental language happening, well, is... is means almost that one doesn't need to deal with it in the school, if I can be provocative there. Looking at a little bit more data from this same survey, where people use English, mainly listening to music, and also web pages. Very little, really, reading and speaking to non-Finnish friends or writing emails or stories, virtually not at all. So here we are, music and the internet. That's it. And that is all that's necessary for them in that context. So, moving on to Sweden, my current home country. Um, Sweden has much the same picture, maybe a little bit more, if anything, because it is absolutely a daily occurrence. This little quote from uh, research evidence of upper secondary school exposure more than 40 hours outside the school on a weekly basis. I'm just trying to think how many hours you spend in school, maybe, well, depending on, on the structure of the schooling system, 30, 35 at the most. So more exposure outside school than any potential exposure inside school. And, and remembering, of course, that English is taught throughout the schooling system, but it's taught as a subject. It's not taught uh, it's not uh, the medium of communication in the school system. All right. Moving on a little bit then, to give you something of a historical perspective on where this incidental English came in to Sweden. 
because I think one has to regard it as a very different context, certainly to Singapore, for very different historical reasons. So, if you start by thinking that one-fifth of the whole Swedish population left Sweden in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as a result of extreme crop failure and poverty. And so there are large communities of Swedes settled in the USA. And in the, early in the early 20th century, they were sending parcels back to their friends and family in Sweden with labels all over from the USA in English. Exciting packages were arriving and families were taking delight in opening these wonderful, exciting packages coming from the US of A. And so English was welcomed into the home at that period. This was followed by silent movies. <laughs> Sorry, it's the best clip I could get, but there's many more, I know. You, you know the Charlie Chaplin stuff. And silent movies, of course, came in English, and they came from the US of A. Exciting stuff. It happened that Sweden had a very high literacy rate at that period. And Swedes were, it just reveled in the opportunity to read on screen in English. There was no issue about it. Of course, the text was fairly short, um, fairly easy to guess at, and, and it was unproblematic for a highly literate society. So, what did Sweden do when the talkies came along in the form of Hollywood? Well, for goodness sake, we know that Swedes understand English because they've had all these movies. We know they're happy to read on screen, so why bother to spend the money on dubbing. Let's just go for the cheap option and have you know, the text on screen in Swedish. But mostly um, families were quite happy to just listen to it in English and make some guesses about what it's about. And so it crept in incidentally in this phase. And reminding you that of course Sweden is a population of oh, today only 9 million. You have to think of the cost of dubbing as, as really out of the question, as it is for most small countries, realistically. Um, moving now then to the current situation, as I've indicated, English is all around, absolutely all around. So firstly, we've mentioned TV and film subtitling. And I want to stress again, evidence from Sweden now today, that the three-year-old, who is exposed to Cartoon Network or whatever it might be in generally American English, by the time, the time they go to school, they have no problem in articulating the TH sound in English, the, which is so problematic for, for some language backgrounds. They're absolutely familiar with it through their incidental learning experience. So pronunciation features, features of Swedish English are extremely, what can I say, um, easy to grasp for any speaker of English from around the world, let me put it like that. Um, pop music is an interesting phenomenon in Sweden. Um, it's virtually all in English, not totally, but virtually. Um, it goes back to, I would say, a watershed moment in 1974 or 6, was it? 4, I think, when ABBA won the Eurovision Song Contest. Do you remember Waterloo? I'm not going to give a demonstration. <laughs> you would suffer too much. <laughs> but it happened that it was in my hometown of Brighton, where I live these days, so I always remember it. And Swedes always know where Brighton is. <laughs> Interestingly, you know, it was a very light pop song. Yeah, very catchy for whatever, for many reasons. But I learned recently, when I visited the ABBA Museum, <laughs> I'm not a great ABBA fan, but I couldn't resist going to it. And it was very interesting to learn that actually it was a very unpopular initiative in Sweden at the time, because Sweden had a very strong left-wing social policy. And this bright commercial music was not acceptable. And so when ABBA won the Eurovision contest and came back to celebrate in Sweden, they were not celebrated. And the next year, because the system is with uh, Eurovision that uh, the winners of one year get to host the next year's event. So next year, Sweden hosted uh, the Eurovision and ABBA were not invited to even be there. <laughs> 
that. <laughs> anyway, but the revolution that happened as a result of ABBA's very commercial style, if you like, uh, led to uh, the taking off of uh, the business, the music business, right across Sweden. And uh, it's become a major, major income revenue source throughout Sweden. If I tell you, no, I don't know, I'm not sure that I'm going to get this quite right, but it, bear with me, it's an approximation. Um, I think it was 2012, the Billboard Top 10 in November 2012, so the American Top 10 list, eight of those chart toppers were either uh, written by a Swede or produced by a Swede. That tells you how big the pop business is in Sweden today. Okay? There are many, many do um, PhDs in, in this field. And they, they, they've developed the technical ability uh, fantastically. So it's an income revenue source, and it's in English. Um, many, many signings around are in English. This is one particular that I liked very much. It's, don't leave valuables in your car. This is at a Stockholm car park. Okay? All around the capital of Stockholm, you'll see many, many signs of this type in English. So the linguistic landscape as it's generally called these days, of Sweden is substantially in English. And, you know, we all know about supermarket shelves with cans of tomatoes in English or whatever it might be, and in Spanish as well, of course. Um, but, you know, to have signposts labeling all around the place in English it has a substantial effect on the, the environmental exposure of every age group to English. And fourthly, I would, of course, this is rather an old picture, actually. I would cite um, the use of the computer, laptop, mobiles, whatever. Nokia is a big Swedish firm. Um, and uh, gaming, particularly. I'm told that the world of Warcraft is very, very powerful for 12-year-old boys in uh, becoming extremely fluent in English as they interact with their play partners around the world, of course, through English. And, you know... Typically, in studies of foreign language learning, boys are often identified as not being quite so successful as girls. There's some data, certainly from the UK, which shows that very clearly. And it's sometimes argued that it's because girls are better language learners, because mm -hmm. girls, and I'm quoting here very carefully, are more social and engage more happily in communication. But here we have boys very definitely engaging in social communication for the purposes that are meaningful for them. So it's an interesting piece of food for thought. So you see, the situation in Sweden is that English is all around, but English is in no sense uh, viewed officially as a national language. It is viewed, I would say, officially as a second language. And I'm not going to go into detail about what happens in the classroom, but I would say there's room for improvement about what happens in the classroom. And I think a lot of that relates to the evidence of what happens outside the classroom. My developing viewpoint on this, really seriously, is that in the future years, we are going to see more and more evidence of the use of whatever language it might be, in this case we're talking about English, for social purposes being the dominant factor in how languages get learned. As we have more and more access to particular languages via different, uh, let's say, digital means of communication, I suspect that's going to be a major influence for the future. And it will be quite hard for us in the classroom to keep up with that influence. So that's just a personal viewpoint. In summary then, I think I can just put in a summary. Um, subtitling is major. Pop music is a major factor. Digital technology, broadly speaking, is substantial. Extensive travel is often a factor. So we're talking about quite a rich country where people travel a lot. I, I mean, I should say, from my town of Umeå up there in the north, the charter flights to Bangkok in December are astonishing. <laughs> people want to get out of the country, but people can afford to get out of the country when the snow comes. So it's, it's English is all around. And within school, there are four generations now of learners of English within the school system. So it's hardly surprising that English is such a high level of fluency in that particular context. Thank you very much.